lot of uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison, all those folks were really heavily influenced by his political theory. And so I think that by looking at John Locke's theory, we can really kind of put into a systematic understanding our own political system and how it works and power structures and all this, right? Um, but before getting right into that, I kind of wanted to talk first about what politics is and what political theory is and why these things are necessary. Um, and I really kind of wanted to hear from you guys about that. So um, what do you guys think politics are? Um, like if you could give a definition of politics. Uh, hey, can I just say something? And I only mean that be halfway to so we're asking about it. I think of prostitution, unfortunately. And it did used to be that way. It what did, did it used to be? It used to be about representing <coughs> people that couldn't make it up to town, where, you know, before we had like telecommuting and stuff. And, you know. What other people think? Well, I was actually just going to go ahead and disagree with Tarot Actor there. Politics has always been about power, or at least politics in this country. There are like. You know, internal politics of Occupy Phoenix, for instance, we argue all the time, and I mean, I'm not necessarily sure it's about power, but unfortunately, a lot of the time it is. Anybody else? A lot of times, I can't really go ahead and tell. Yeah, well, it is all, like, how I thought it was all about poli like, um, power as well, and that's, that's kind of how I thought it was. Like. Anybody Today's else? politics? Just politics, whatever you want to define politics as. I think government politics have changed, yeah. but, but I, believe, I think politics is all right, but not today's modern politics. So like, right now, they're all looking out for themselves, to better themselves, the line, and people have no vote anymore. So it's kind of like Keith was saying, there are prostitutes. That's interesting analysis. So, I don't know. A lot of times, when you're going through political theory, you're going through different kinds of Define politics as who gets what, where, when, how, right? So who gets what resources? Who gets water? Who gets water? Who gets food? How do they get these resources? And who do they get them from, right? And cost. And cost, yeah, 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 right? And how much do these things cost? Who determines those costs, right? So, you know, it's really interesting that we had two folks here bring up the issue of power because <laughs> within that, that very basic definition, who gets what, when, where, and how, Power is not included in that definition, but somebody there has the power to, to determine who gets all of those things, right? And so, any, pol any, any, to me, any definition of politics that doesn't include power is really missing, like the key point. But um, the what is power, at least in American politics, authority. who gets what? The authority well, over other people. I'm not even talking about authority. It's how you end up with the authority. It's from getting the power. The power being resources, capital, whatever. The what is. Right. It's a really Cap no, it's really Money is power. Or their image. Yeah. You know, really, maybe it's not really power. It's maybe capital. it's all about that's all their image of themselves, you know? So uh -huh. they sell themselves out thinking that's, this is the best image. Yeah. It's okay. the best life. Now we're climbing up a, um, a pyramid. Like, if you sell yourself and everything you climb over, it's, I see like you climb up a pyramid, have more power you know, over time. King of the hill. Yeah, king of the hill. And there's always someone at the top. Like, you know, just like a pyramid, but power. It's always a white thing. <laughs> it's really, this is a really interesting conversation. We could go in a lot of different ways about this, right? Um, before we move, we're already moving into like a lot of what's going on with John Locke. So before we do that, I just want to make a couple of quick points about um, another definition of politics that might be more effective and more interesting for um, Occupy in particular. Um, Mary Dietz, a professor in Michigan, states that the that politics are the collective and participatory engagement of citizens in determining the affairs of their community and in doing so regaining um, the power of their community, right? So, Is yeah, what, what do people think about that? Uh, Mary Dietz, she's a professor of political science in Michigan. Um, 
Oh, I got an idea. How about uh, the overall outcome of the uh, individual actions and decisions, actions taken by and decisions made by individual people? So, it's, is that your definition of politics? That, or that we you would use a definition, that definition for defining politics? Sure. Yeah. With that definition, there's a lot of focus on individuality, right? And so my question would be like, who, what makes up the community? Is it just a bunch of individuals acting independently? Or are there like individuals, you know, cooperating with their community members? Do you know what I mean? Well, everything comes down to individual actions, um, whether you choose to cooperate with your community members or not. Okay, so this is a good point, right? So John Locke's theory kind of focuses on a lot of individuality. It's very, it's very based on your individual liberty and the, the person's freedom to, to, to do as they will, so to speak, right? Um, and be, because of that, when you did, any, did anybody do the reading? That's fine if you didn't. I'm just curious. I didn't know there was a reading. Yeah, I didn't know that. That okay. no, nobody all, did the reading. That's fine. Me. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> You, I encourage doing the reading. Um, the man doesn't know how to use periods, so it can be kind of a pain in the ass. But <laughs> um, it's really interesting to just see how this guy from the 1600s can really shed some light on things that are happening today, right? But he has basically what he's doing in the second treaties of government is defending why an absolute monarchy is not a legitimate form of government, right? And the folks prior to Locke who were saying the absolute monarchy is a legitimate form of government said basically because God said so, right? Because the king is directly descended from God and he has been given divine right to rule and they base this on all kinds of different things in the Bible, right? And this is called, in a lot of ways, this is called patriarchy because it says one man is in charge and he has power over the rest of his subjects, right? So, and this is how Europe was ruled forever and ever and ever, right? Uh, you had a king, he had power over his subjects, and then you had uh, individual families, and the man had power over his, his families, right? So, long history of single rulers, whether it be at like a governmental level or an individual uh, family level. And John Locke said, no, that's not right, that can't be true, because if you look at the Bible, um, God did not give absolute dominion to Adam, uh, right? Who's the first? Actually, we're all generally familiar with this, right? Uh, he, uh, he didn't, got, Adam didn't have direct uh, and divine rule over all of the people on earth, and neither did his hair, so therefore the king doesn't either, and this isn't right, right? And basically Locke comes to the understanding that what makes government legitimate is that it is uh, made by the consent of the people, right? That people come together and consent of them. Which sounds great, right? We're all kind of coming together as a community to agree to live under one structure, right? Um, so, in doing, in, in, in having to justify that, he has to go back and try to understand where power comes from, right? And he talks a lot about the state of nature. And in the state of nature, this is a state of nature prior to any government, like when people are just kind of running around and doing whatever they, they do without government. And his perception of the state of nature is very, um, very antagonistic, so to speak. Everybody has perfect freedom and that they can do what they will, right? And everybody is uh, totally equal because nobody has more power than another. They all have a right to live, so they all have the right to take what they need to live. And it's very individualistic, right? It's just people kind of wander around, they might run into each other at one point in time, maybe they don't, but for the most part it's just you out there surviving. Um, and so the question is, if everybody's so free and equal, then why would they want to come together to form a civil society? government, right? And he argues that this is because with everybody free, being free and equal, everybody is also subject to uh, to invasion by others, right? And so so anybody can come in and take whatever it is from you, your life, your liberty, your property, right? And they can just come in and take it. There's nobody to tell them not to. But that doesn't make any sense. <coughs> Go ahead, yeah. Like it actually doesn't make any sense for that to happen because if everybody has the right to life and, and, and to that liberty of life, and nobody else has the right to try to take that from you. Mm -hmm. Any like livelihood of any kind. Right, so it's really interesting because that, that contradiction is really key here, I think. He says, at one point he's saying that everybody's gonna come steal everything from everybody, we don't have any safety in the, in, in the state of nature, but at the 
same time, he believes that people can live by a, a um, code of reasonableness, yeah. and that they, that therefore, that that, that won't, that, that doesn't need to happen, you know. But it's really unclear, like how how can people be at one point, you know, like out to get each other destructive, and at another point reasonable enough not to do that, right? So it implies to me at least that there's some special group of people somewhere that have can, can do that, right? And that the rest of the people can decide who, who that special group is. Right. So I think when you when you think about when you think about why folks in Locke's theory would be coming together to form political society, right, and to protect or to come come together to form political society, society Locke says that it's basically, um, I'll just read this quote, it says, political power then I take it to be a right of making laws with penalties of death and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property and of employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and in the defense of the common law from foreign injury. And all of this is only for the public good. So in other words, government comes together to protect individual property for the public good, essentially, right? And so this, this again, is where we see a lot of, um, I mean, if you think about our society today, right? I mean, look, these buildings are more protected than like our rights to freedom of speech are, right? This is property, right? So this, this, this idea has been pushed throughout, throughout our society since the 1600s, so to speak, right? So, you know, and a, there, a lot of like, there's a lot of good that comes out of Locke too. I mean, when he was writing this, he was writing in complete revolution, like against the king, right? He was saying absolute monarchy is the worst thing ever. We need to do something new and different. So at, the, at his time, he was very much a radical and a revolutionary, right? But what happened was that when he placed so much emphasis on property, it gave political property, uh, political power. Um, with weight and property. The more property you have, the more power you have. You can see this in society, in American society today. So, um, yeah, what do people think? What do you guys What do you guys think? Do you think that's a legitimate critique of America? Do you think that we do value property over all other values? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, how do you guys see that? <laughs> well, I think, I think it's not, it's not just property, but also capital, which I guess is kind of, uh, kind of these days blurred together. But uh, like, it's it's just a, I don't know. I don't know. The people who own stuff have all the power. <laughs> yeah, the more the more <laughs> stuff, the more money you have, which is stuff. Essentially, it's property. Essentially, right. as opposed to you know actual personhood. What other, anybody else? But even like with the money, like the people with the, the paper money, like that, those people don't matter. I always use Jay-Z as my example. Like, he's got a little bit of money. I'm sure he owns a couple of houses, but like he doesn't own buildings. He doesn't own, you know, a diamond mine somewhere. He doesn't own resources. It's the people who actually have stuff. Yeah, like, actually they stuff. need the resources. They need to own things. And I mean, for the Waldens, for instance, they at least think, or I mean, in many ways, they do own human capital. They own people. And like, so you actually need tangible objects more than you need paper money. Still, today. Do people have a, a definition of capital that they're familiar with? Very, just throwing it out there, very generally capital is uh, wealth used to create more wealth, right? So, bulldozers to line things and all this stuff like that. Um, you can have to do with capital and all this kind of things. Um, Oh, there's also also in John in, in his in his theory here, there's kind of an assumption that property, owning property somehow equates to freedom. That if you, you are free, if your property is safe, and then you can claim it, right? And in some ways that can relate to the idea like, well I have my shelter, you know, I have my home and I have food and these things are my security, right? But like if freedom is only defined as property, is that a narrow definition of freedom? Does that like reduce our ability to to you know to be ourselves, to move up in society in any ways? I don't know. What do you guys think? I think freedom is not needing or wanting property. Like, well, yeah. Well, it's, the more you yeah, the more money you have. Okay, so if you want to come back to me. Yeah. Um, 
I think too that you can you can see this, right? We have we have people who own property who own wealth, right? Like Monsanto, Walmart, whatever. Or, you know, big gigantic groups like that. The president, you know, all this access to all this wealth, right? Um, and you can see how, in in many ways, like for, for them, they have like this this sense of freedom. That they don't have to worry about their bills being paid. That's all something. They don't they don't have to struggle pretty much, right? They don't have to struggle to survive. That's all there for them. They don't have to worry about it, right? So, in in some ways, when you equate when you equate property to freedom, yeah, you can get a certain amount of freedom if you can get they're a lot of property. More oppressed though, in a lot of ways, they really are almost more oppressed because they're they're still under the burden of the idea that. <clears throat> we need that in order to function and survive, and, and you have to have that kind of competition in society as opposed to community in society. But I think that's a valid point, but from that <laughs> theory, you can see how he could create this idea that property would equal, equal freedom, right? But at the same time, in order for property equal freedom for some, it means that everybody else has to kind of be uh, taken away from and exploited, and other people don't get that same amount of freedom that these folks get by taking property. So to me, that's not a valid definition freedom at all. <laughs> it seems very uh, very narrow and very <coughs> non-effective and explains in many ways why we have so many class distinctions in America and why why there's so so few who are at the top and so uh, many others who are at the bottom and you know even three get to that top is cheating uh, other people is very hard to do. That's what they're being paid to do is cheat people. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, I guess that's kind of all I have, because I just, uh, the idea was to talk about the first four chapters today, um, because they're only, like, it's only like 20 pages, it's not very long, uh, but if folks haven't read it, then I don't know what you guys might want to talk about, so, I don't really have much time. I don't know if you sound naive, but who is this John Locke guy? Oh, that's okay. Do you ever um, read John Locke? I haven't read him since, since I was actually in college. John Locke. Yeah, no, John Locke, he was, he was, uh, um, He's a, he, he's a philosopher, a political philosopher uh, from the 1600s. His parents were both Protestants. He was raised, his dad was a lawyer. Um, he went to Oxford and he got a degree in philosophy and then had a physician for a long time. And uh, yeah, basically, he got involved in politics when he became a personal physician for this guy. John Locke, I know from that uh, Lost show. Uh, it's interesting that his name is yeah, John Locke. I now, when you were saying that, I was kind of <laughs> tripped on that. But no, it's just um, a lot of the ideas. Like he has, he has a line in here somewhere, and it basically says that everybody has the right to. Uh, I don't know what the fuck is our constitution? Like liberty and the pursuit of property is what Locke says, and property was translated into life liberty. So a lot of what he says.